Welcome to the Educate, Empower, and Evolve podcast. My name is Haley Vera, and I'm a lifestyle coach with my roots in holistic nutrition, personal training, and yoga. I'm a total nerd with a huge passion for gut health and optimizing performance naturally. My mission with the E3 podcast is to help you acquire the knowledge that you need to evolve and reach the next level of yourself. Welcome back to the E3 podcast. I'm your host, Haley Vera. And as always, I'm stoked to be here. That's the word that I feel today is I feel stoked. Today's topic is one of my favorites. And everybody knows me as like the gut health girl. And today we are going to be talking about my number one tip for good gut health. And it's funny, actually, we did a client Q&A yesterday. And this question came up from one of my clients in check-ins. What is your number one tip for good gut health? And so I brought that to our Q&A and there was three other uh, coaches on the call with me. Uh, We had Melody there, we had Kennedy there, and we had Kenzie there. So there was four of us hosting the call. And I was like, before I answer this, I want to know what you ladies think and what you think and what you would advise for having the best gut health. You know, what's your number one tip for good gut health? And most people, uh, most of the coaches said to avoid processed food, to minimize processed food in your diet and to focus on whole foods. Now, I actually love this. I think that that is very key and it's a very important part in the foundation of good gut health is minimizing processed food and alcohol and maximizing the amount of whole foods in your diet. Now, whole foods, I always make the corny joke, not whole foods, like whole pizzas or foods with holes in them like donuts, but like actual whole foods, foods that look like they came out of the earth, minimal processing um, is better. Now, my advice, well, there was actually one other piece of advice that came from the coaches before I get into my advice, was to minimize stress. And I actually love that because stress totally changes the environment of your gut. If you think of the animals that live in the desert, like the creepy crawlies and the scorpions and the the flora that lives there, like the cacti, really kind of like vicious and hardy, you know, takes a lot to kill them. That's the type of bacteria that can thrive with an unhealthy diet and high stress. It is the more pathogenic strains of bacteria. Uh, We call them negative. uh, Well, pathogenic isn't necessarily negative gram, but negative gram bacteria basically have a double wall on them and they're more resistant, more resistant to antibiotics, more resistant to anything that can harm them essentially. And then it's our beneficial flora that are more delicate and they are impacted by processed foods by um, herbicides, pesticides, um, you know, medications, antibiotics, they're more heavily impacted by that because they only have like one outer wall. And there are beneficial strains of, or I guess, bacteria that we live with that are in some way benefiting us, even if they are the more resistant strains, we need to have a good balance of both. But if we are overgrown with negative gram bacteria, that can create a lot of problems. Um, now I'm not going to like really, really dive into it today. I'm just, I just want to give you guys my number one thing for good gut health and why. Okay. So stress management, super important, whole foods, super important. But if you're looking to maintain good gut health or heal your gut, here's the one thing that you need to avoid. It's gluten. And a lot of people will say, oh, well, I feel pretty fine when I eat bread and like, I feel okay when I have gluten, like that's okay. Like if you do feel that way, my advice to those people is to still minimize it in your diet. I wouldn't have it in your house and I would only eat that. Let's say for example, you are going to a friend's house for dinner and you don't want to um, like necessarily offend them by saying no to the delicious meal that they've made you, then that would be an opportunity for you to, you know, kind of work or I guess create some expectation or sorry, some exceptions for yourself um, to that, you know, general rule of thumb of avoiding gluten. There may be exceptions in social settings. My clients and I talk a lot about the values of food, social connectedness, enjoyment, pleasure, you know, you're going camping, you want to have 
Um, you know, you want to be able to in, enjoy um, the, you know, pasta salad that your friend made for you. Those types of situations, I would say that you can make an exception. But if you have reactions to gluten that are very strong, then my advice to you is to avoid it completely, to make sure you pack all your own snacks and pack your own foods and let your friends know when you're coming over that you don't eat gluten before they've made the meal. You know, that's your job to set those boundaries in your life and to communicate with other people on your needs so that you can take care of yourself. And Healthy Boundaries is a podcast we've done before. Gluten is a really tough one for a lot of people because it's in everything. It's in sauces. It is in you know, pasta, it's in bread, it's in like, even in like a Caesar salad in the croutons, right? It's in everything I can think of that is kind of, you know, fast food related. So, you know, when things go into the deep fryer, um, there's going to be gluten contaminants in there. So if you're celiac, you can't have, you know, deep fried food unless it's cooked in a separate fryer, breads, um, buns, bagels, cereal, most of that will be gluten containing unless it says gluten free on it. Most con- most products that are gluten free will boast about it. Um, now the reason that we're going to avoid this, I'm going to get into it deeper. So before you decide that you don't want to give up gluten and you're just going to peace out, and you're like, screw it, I feel fine when I eat gluten, I'm going to keep eating it. Please stick around because I have a little bit more to share with you. It's not just gluten. Gluten comes along with two other brothers, okay? So I call it the three terrible Gs, and I am going to break this down in a way that you guys can like really understand how it's impacting you. Now, when you cut out gluten, your baseline will change. Your baseline will change. Right now, you tell me you feel fine, but fine isn't optimal. Fine isn't excellent. You're not bouncing off the walls with energy, right? Lots of people will say, oh, I feel fine when I eat gluten, yet they're struggling with headaches. They have hormone imbalances. They feel bloated. They have acne, psoriasis. They have rosacea. They have eczema, skin conditions of some kind. And yet they say, oh, I feel fine when I eat gluten. Well, your baseline is so low that you don't know how it's impacting you anymore. And I promise you that if you take it out for eight weeks, eight to 12 weeks, and then you reintroduce it, you will notice the baseline change. Now, the other side of that is that if you react very strongly to it and you take it out for 12 weeks, it's likely you'll have less of an aggressive response as long as you're not celiac. And celiac is actually an autoimmune condition. Um, But if you're not celiac, then your intolerance to it will improve because as you reduce it in your diet, you will become less reactive to it right? So there's a couple of different directions it can go depending on where you're at with your current gut health, the severity of the hyperpermeability or the leaky gut that's going on. And of course, things like genetic differences, your own like microbiome, um, you know, your stress levels are going to impact that your general lifestyle, your eating habits, how quickly you eat. (laughs) Um, What else? Uh, you know, is going to go into that is going to be very dependent on how you respond to gluten. So it isn't just gluten. There are so many things that impact our gut, but I want to focus and zoom in on this so you can understand why I recommend to my clients that they eliminate it from their diet and then use the values of food. You know, it's Christmas time and you really want a shortbread cookie that's made of gluten and it, it doesn't have like an allergic impact for you then that's the time that you can make that exception. But it comes with consequences. And I'm going to explain that right now. So the three terrible G's, and I'm not going to start with gluten, but this comes part and party. It comes along with gluten in many products. So gluten comes in many grains. Um, So there's different gluten containing grains. Barley is one of them. Wheat is one of them. And it's people don't really understand how many products wheat is actually in until you start looking at the labels. Almost every single processed food I can think of, candy bars, um, like packaged dinners, um, microwavable dinners, those things, like looking at the label, there's likely wheat of some kind in those ingredients. So the three terrible Gs, let's let's dive in. Glyphosate, you guys. Um, is a really potent, broad-spectrum antibiotic that's used widely around the world, most notably in the common weed killer called Roundup. So its herbicide effectiveness was discovered by Monsanto, uh, who's a chemist, John E. Franz, in 1970. 
So um, by Monsanto's chemists, sorry. And Monsanto brought it to market for agricultural use in 1974 under the trade name Roundup. So glyphosate is an antibiotic discovered by a chemist in 1970, and the company that he worked for, Monsanto, brought it to the market in 1974. There's a really strong correlation between IBS and bowel disease and the use of glyphosate on, gra on uh, grains and crops. This is not isolated to wheat products, you guys. It's used on non-organic grains, corn, soy, and oats, and rice. It's been shown to disrupt the gut microbiome and increase gut permeability. So glyphosate actually has been found to reduce the beneficial bacteria in the gut because of its antimicrobial or antibiotic properties while increasing the growth of harmful bacteria. Remember I talked about the desert and how the like cacti and the scorpions survive that environment? Well, the glyphosate is creating that environment. The stress will also create a different environment inside your body for species of bacteria to survive, but glyphosate killing off beneficial bacteria will leave less of the protective bacteria and more of the harmful bacteria. That disruption in the gut can lead to inflammation and further increase gut permeability. So I want to talk about permeability of the gut. Now, when I talk about this with my mentor, we talk about the two zippers essentially. And so if you imagine, like take your fingers for a second and hold them really close together. Now that is how I imagine the villi or like the little fingers of my gut, how they're supposed to be held together, like nice and tight. And they're held together by tight junction proteins. Now, when we get inflammation, just pull the tips of your fingers apart. And there's like little spaces there, right? That's what happens under the presence of inflammation in the gut, which glyphosate can cause. It irritates the gut and it creates inflammation. It also kills off the beneficial bacteria that are managing inflammation. So we are less, um, I guess, less resistant to, or more susceptible to inflammation would be the right um, terminology. Now, the next thing that glyphosate does is it stimulates a protein or an enzyme, which is basically a protein called zonulin. That enzyme unzips the second zipper. Okay, now spread your fingers really wide apart and look at them. Look at your hand. If you're driving, then keep your hands on the steering wheel. Look at your hand and look how big those gaps have become. Now, your palm, where your fingers meet your palm, is going to be where your immune system lies. So your immune system lies just behind this protective lining that's meant to be a selectively permeable membrane. It is choosing what is coming through into your bloodstream in terms of nutrients. And what happens when we have zonulin, his zonulin um, is actually increases uh, under infection as well because it wants to create a flushing reaction to flush things out so it can bring water into the gut. So zonulin, ta-da, <laughs> now we have these massive gaps. So we've gone from inflammation, a little bit of separation, zonulin separates it really wide, and now you have this permeable sieve. So now we have intestinal permeability. We call this hyperpermeability. And that can create lots of health issues because we know that leaky gut is not just connected to symptoms of bowel disorder. So, you know, bloating, um, inconsistent bowel movements, constipation, diarrhea, you know, or just the kind of um, flip-flopping back and back and forth between the two. This, I guess, the environment that glyphosate creates is hyperpermeability. And at the same time, glyphosate affects our gut enzymes. This is the scary part, affects the gut enzymes, our muscle proteins, and depletes manganese, which leads to poor gut motility and reduced production of essential precursors to neurotransmitters and hormones. So now glyphosate is disrupting the gut, creating hyperpermeability, messing with your enzymes that break down your food so you're not digesting your food properly anymore, affects your muscle proteins and depletes manganese, which is leading to poor motility, meaning slower transit time. And that can lead to a whole host of fermentation issues within the gut. And now we're ending up with precursors, the essential precursors to neurotransmitters not being produced and to our hormones. So now we have a disruption in our balance of neurotransmitters and hormones that impacts our mood, that impacts anxiety and depression, that impacts your sex hormones like estrogen, testosterone, et cetera. And glyphosate. Now that there's that leaky gut, if we keep piling it in there, we have gluten for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We have cereal, we have sandwich, we have pasta. Now that it's meant to be selectively permeable membrane over time becomes very damaged. And just whatever the hell wants to go through there is going through there. Glyphosate can get into our, our bloodstream 
and can cause neuroinflammation. And that can actually create neurodegenerative decline. Um, and we actually see a lot of um, relative to conditions to leaky gut, things like arthritis, um, asthma, like anything inflammatory, essentially. There's a lot of science that screams collateral damage. And um, I actually wrote a blog post on this and I showed uh, an increase in the rise of bowel disease in the correlation with the increase in use of glyphosate. And it is so scary how close those graphs are. Now let's take a look at gluten. So gluten usually coming in combination with glyphosate, but gluten doesn't necessarily have to come with glyphosate. You could have an organic wheat and you're like, great, I'll just eat organic wheat. Hold on before, hold your horses before we get there. Gluten is a protein found in wheat, barley, and rye, okay? While it's commonly associated with celiac disease, many people unknowingly have an adverse reaction to gluten without having this disease. Gluten is really hard to break down because it's a very complex protein structure. In the right environment, it should be broken down in the stomach, okay? Your stomach is where your proteins get broken down. They come in long chains of amino acids, and we call these peptides, and then your hydrochloric acid is meant to break down those chains into smaller absorbable um, amino acids. But when we're stressed, we produce, we produce less hydrochloric acid. Okay. When we have less hydrochloric acid, that alone can lead to protein malabsorption and protein maldigestion. And so that sets us up for fermentation of proteins in the large intestine um, and in the gut. And that can lead to negative gram bacteria. Um, overgrowth, like fermentation, so bloating, gas, and also when we have less hydrochloric acid production, it can actually set us up for SIBO. So eating in a stress state and eating gluten in a stress state, how many people are eating gluten on the go in their car, smashing back their burger or their breakfast sandwich on their way to work? Like that is a really perfect storm to create leaky gut. And SIBO. Um, so if gluten is allowed to go undigested from the stomach into the small intestine, it can act as an irritant to the skin of the villi and the intestinal wall. So if we're eating in a stress state or we don't have good hydrochloric acid production, there's a lot that goes into making hydrochloric acid and maybe you're just not good at producing it for various reasons. Another podcast on that. Then what happens is that gluten gets into our intestines from the stomach where it's already supposed to be digested, but it's not, and it irritates the intestines. And that can inflame and create leaky gut again. So it's separating those junctions of the gut wall. Now, gluten, um, not well digested, likely due to its uh, content of proline rich amino acids. Those are the ones that are particularly difficult for the body to break down and they require specific enzymes to do so. And some people struggle to produce the enzymes necessary to break down those proteins. And we already know that glyphosate plays a role in our ab ability to produce enzymes in the gut as well. Now, finally, you guys, let's move on to the brother of gluten, which is gliadin. So gluten and gliadin come hand in hand. They're come piling in together. Um, it's like dumb and dumber. They're just never apart. Um, so gliadin, I just don't know if that was the best analogy there. My brain just went to dumb and dumber for the movie for a second. And I just had this image of them like riding that scooter <laughs> together. Do you guys remember that scene where they're like, and then the one guy on the back pees and they're like stuck together when they get off the bike? That's gluten and gliadin. They come piling in together. They are not separate. So even though they're considered separate proteins, they're going to come in conjunction. So gliadin, again, found in rye, barley, and wheat, component of gluten, a group of proteins that gives its dough its elast elasticity and helps it to rise. So gliadin triggers the upregulation of zonulin. And that, again, remember we have gluten, even if it's organic, it's hard to digest creates irritation of the gut wall, then gliadin comes in, increases zonulin. Now we have irritation, first zipper, zonulin, second zipper, boom, back to the same hyperpermeability, even if it's an organic wheat. So you may not have the same damage to the, to the gut. You may not have the same, um, I guess, collateral damage in terms of like wiping out the microflora, et cetera. Um, with just gluten and gliadin, but when the three of them come together, that pushes us into the development of leaky gut. So let's recap. Gluten might not be well digested due to lack of hydrochloric acid or insufficient amount of enzymes. Gliadin and glyphosate increase onulin, and glyphosate disrupts the delicate balance of microflora and increases gut permeability. 
So for some people, giving up gluten can really unlock a new level of their health and energy. And I know that it does for me. This is usually true for people who are experiencing the onset of IBS or digestive distress. Now, other less common symptoms of leaky gut can present as fatigue, brain fog, acne, asthma, hormone imbalances, depression, anxiety, joint pain. That's all related to the health and integrity of your gut. And remember that glyphosate messes with your hormones and neurotransmitters. If you're struggling with anxiety and depression or hormones imbalances, like major mood swings, bad PMS symptoms, you really need to work on incorporating more organic grains and getting off the glyphosate. So additionally, you guys, many gluten-containing foods are high in refined carbohydrates, which can, you know, obviously disrupt our blood sugar balance and further contribute to low energy levels. Just the micronutrient density is not there. So by replacing these foods with nutrient dense options, you will improve your overall nutrition and fuel that your body needs to thrive. So eliminating gluten, you guys, focusing on organic grains. I recommend things like rice, black rice, red rice, black rice, you guys has more phytonutrients than blueberries, um, antioxidants than blueberries. Sorry. So fascinating rice, oats, buckwheat. Um, I love buckwheat actually really awesome grain and looking for those organic ones. Now, the great thing about organic grains is that they're still cheap. You know, it's like, are you, is it really a big deal to spend $7 on a massive bag of oats instead of four? Like it's really not that big of a difference and it's not going to break your bank and it is going to help you with your gut. So that's going to help with your overall health and well-being and gut health just to remove gluten containing products from your diet. The next step is to remove non-organic grains and to only focus on organic grains and keep gluten away. All right, you guys, that is everything for today. I hope that this was helpful and that you learned something new. If you are interested in working with me and learning more about nutrition, about how to fuel your body properly and know FODMAP is not the only way to heal your gut please send me a message. I would love to hear from you. You can message me on Instagram or Facebook. It's Haley Vera. You can find me on my webpage. Just hit the let's chat button and you can go to healthpillars.ca. Just hit let's chat and I can talk to you there. And yeah, I would love to chat to you more about what you're struggling with. And we can chat about one-to-one -one -to -one coaching and how I can help you. Have an amazing day. Thank you for tuning in to the E3 podcast. I love having you here and I appreciate your time. I know that it's valuable. Peace, love, and personal growth. And I will catch you on the next episode. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode on the E3 podcast. I had so much fun sharing my knowledge with you and I hope that you enjoyed today's show. If you found value in this episode, the number one thing that you can do to support the show is share this episode on your social media platforms or leave a review. If you'd like to find out about the lifestyle programs I offer online, go to healthpillars.ca and click apply today to fill out an application for coaching. Make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Peace, love, and personal growth.